Hey, 3 dm Jairs, this is Coach Brad Loomis, and you're listening to the 3D Muscle Journey Podcast. Today, you'll hear me talking to Alberto Nunez and Jeff Alberts about where ego fits into our worlds of bodybuilding, powerlifting, and lifting in general. This seems like a simple topic, but is way more multifaceted than most can imagine, especially in our little corner of the world where the way you look is intertwined with your sports-specific progress. And while ego is generally thought of as a bad thing, we will be covering both sides of it throughout this podcast. We'll discuss common roadblocks that ego creates for ourselves and our athletes, how we handle inflated egos as coaches, and even some instances where ego can actually be useful in changing your physique, getting stronger, and enhancing your athletic journey. As per usual, if you have any feedback or comments on this episode, head on over to 3dmusclejourney.com or our YouTube channel at youtube.com backslash team 3dmj and leave it under podcast number 137. Here is Using and Losing Your Ego with Jeff Alberts, Alberto Nunez, and yours truly, Brad Loomis. See, I was supposed to start this, but I'm not going to start this because because Jeff was low key talking mess before the podcast got rolling. Uh, <laughs> what are we talking about, Jeff? I don't know, man. I'm the most humble one out of us three, so I think I think uh, maybe Brad's got the biggest ego on the team. I I, I think I think yeah, Brad. Brad's if got I do, I don't have any reason. I get any cheese? <laughs> I'd say. Shoot. Yeah. So ego is the conversation today. Um, I think most often we do think about of ego as something that kind of gets in the way of your own personal development when it comes to all this. Um, I also think there's sometimes cases where, uh, yeah, you need to give yourself a little boost too, you know, so it can go both ways. But obviously, I think the most common one is our own ego like, tries, tends to get in the way of, of our development and all this. Uh, what you gentlemen agree that we've experienced that with ourselves and with our our athletes yeah i think so i in fact really i didn't even uh think of it as a positive spin burrow so that's uh, kind of opened up my mind and my uh opened up even the conversation i think yeah yeah there's i think there's definitely a time and a place to you know yeah stick out your chest. double edged sword for sure mm-hmm. no doubt yeah yeah um So I guess just kind of going in a circle, um, when we think of, uh, personally speaking, a time where our own ego got in the way, um, could you guys like go back to maybe a period of time in your bodybuilding where, yeah, that was, that was interfering with your development? (laughs) I guess, well, you know, because I'm I'm trying to be humble here and go last. You're all waiting for Jeff, because you got, you got some stories, man, you do. And it's oh crazy because it's so contrasting to, to, I guess, who you are now, right? That's, oh, that's yeah. what I think makes it so big. Yeah, so we'll go way back to the early 90s um, or even way back to high school because back then as a sophomore in high school, I had a body weight of 165. I benched 330. So I was doubling my body weight in high school on bench press. And... Pound for pound, I was probably the strongest in the school as far as that lift. So, man, I thought I was the shit, basically, at school. Uh, I was wearing tank tops, you know, I had to show the muscles off. Um, And I just remember, you know, kind of being that that big fish in a small pond that, you know, all the attention I was getting, oh, look at Jeff, that type of thing. I can't get swelled my head up. And that kind of stemmed. I guess, like for the years that followed, like probably a good decade or more that any input, let's say outside input, someone would maybe say, hey, Jeff, why don't you try this? It was like, who are you to tell me? Well, I know what I'm doing here. So it basically just having like a a big head, you know, having like that ego, it just prevented me from actually improving, getting better because I was limiting myself because I had a lot of walls up because of it. So just early on, like for at least a decade, man, it was like that where just like 
I was kind of like that big fish in a little pond. And then when I started competing, I was like doing well in these local shows. And, you know, of course, when you win, it's just like reinforces, you know, that mentality, that behavior. So it was just like many, many years where I just like had those walls up and it limited my growth. I think not just my growth physically, but more importantly, mentally and emotionally. So my maturity level, it took a long time for me to like actually become more mature, not only as a bodybuilder, as a person. So it probably wasn't until my shit, maybe late 20s, early 30s, where I started to let some of those walls come down and being a little bit more humble. But but I'll kind of leave it there. So that's kind of my, my early days in a nutshell. Yeah, and I can definitely but, relate. Even to this day, I kind of kick myself for the same mentality that you had, Jeff, because I remember um, vividly, you know, when I won my first show, um, I was trained in the old max OT, you know, maximum overload training method. And I owned the gym here in town and I trained the folks and, you know, uh, everybody got good results, you know, using max OT. And that was kind of what I professed. And, and I remember, Vividly, I would always like probably display the American American College of Sports Medicine's recommendation, you know, for resistance training, and pretty much all the Max OT principles were there. And so I was like, "Man, I'm the shit. I got this down." <laughs> I, I'm I, at the at the time I would have thought that I was the Eric Helm, you know, uh, the Mike Zerdos of, of of the the bodybuilding industry. And now, of course, you fast forward, you know, what is it, shoot, a few decades, I think to myself, damn, what, what could I look like now? And what would my capabilities be now if I just would have not closed off thinking that was the only way to train, you know, and that was just because myself and my, my clients got the results from that particular system what what could i be like now if i would have learned about other systems and learned more about um you know the things that we know today and, and basically just listen to other people who at the time i didn't think knew more than me but now it's like yeah they probably knew more than me just because they were willing to listen and they were willing to um be open-minded. And uh, I, I often think about how lucky people are today in regards to all the resources they have. And I tell myself, well, that's, you know, that's why, um, you know, you see some younger athletes doing the things they're doing is because it's, it's literally everywhere. It's like, you'd be a fool to miss what are some good resources nowadays. But in hindsight, I go back to when I started and if I really, really wanted to, like I, there were some pretty decent people like still there. Like I, I, I remember some point super early on, like picking up starting strength and just kind of looking at it. And I'm like, that's a funny looking squat, man. And that routine <laughs> looks like nothing compared to like what my bodybuilding heroes were doing. It's like, these people know nothing. But there's a part of me that, you know, you go through a few pages and they're like, man, they, they kind of make sense. And this is, this, this, <laughs> this, this seems very reasonable. And, and, you know, like between that and, and there was there was a small section of, of people within the natural bodybuilding community that were, um, you know, they were fans of um, of, a, of of a more evidence based practice. And it was such a small community that like literally, I'm, I, I feel that I could have emailed Dr. Joe like way back in like 1999 and been like, Yo, Joe, I want to learn everything about like how to eat better, you know. But um, you know, I was having moderate success uh, on my own. Um, and, you know, like most people who you know, end up doing OK on stage, I was like usually like among the top percentile in my little gym. Right. So it's like, OK, I don't really need help. I'm doing just fine, like doing things the way I, I want to. And it wasn't until I um, I decided to prep for the first time that I'm like, you know what? I think I'll do this. I'll do just fine. You know, I'll get a coach at some point, but I think I'll be able to get 90 percent of it on my own the first go around. And then that ended up being like six months, like 
a waste of time, basically. And it ended up being the only time I competed back to back years because I felt like I had to go back the next year and make up for it. And this time I actually hired a coach and I dropped the ego and I, I, I let someone, you know, basically, uh, you know, take care of the, 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 the big picture planning and, uh, boy, did it pay off. And I go back to, to, you know, that season and yeah, it would have been way better had I hired a coach the first time. Uh, but then it takes me back to, you know, that wasn't, it just became very clear that time that, you know, I, I didn't know as much as I thought I did. And, um, and just how stubborn I was and how my ego was getting in the way of my, my own growth. But that was my seventh year of training. And it was only really exposed because, shoot, it was a six-month block where I had to arrive at a certain place by the end of it. So it made me rethink of, man, imagine all the stuff kind of like you guys that I, I might have missed out on because I was just not willing to to be a student. And now, um, man, there's, there's certain people who, like, I'll interact with who, you know, they're doing pretty good uh, in their, on their own behalf and and they know quite a bit and it gets to the point like where you're talking to them and you just literally like they're just they're absorbing everything and you're like oh you sneaky bastard but at the same time <laughs> like, but I'm like but you have no ego and that's pretty dope that you feel like hey you know you've yeah. you you you've you've you you know this much but you're still there learning and forever a student um so so yeah I, I want to be one of those people, and I still get in my own way from time to time, but it's much, 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 much better than it, it was at the start of my journey. And obviously, I think now we can say in hindsight that easy, the sooner you drop that, the better off you're going to be in the long run. Yeah, for sure. I was just watching this documentary on Netflix. It's called West Side Versus the World, and it's basically a documentary on Louis Simmons and the, the West Side Barbell you know, from way back in the 70s. And... Around the mid '90s, when um, it seemed like there was uh, that was kind of like the the springboard of like bodybuilding and like the the fitness evolution, I guess you might say. That was kind of prior to the internet and YouTube and all that. And if you called Westside Barbell, Louis Simmons would be the one to pick up the phone. And I think to myself at the time, I'm like, damn, that the '90s is when I was kind of trying mm -hmm. to gather information. If only I would have known. You could have actually talked to the creator of West Side Barbell Club if you just called the number, you know. Um, and yeah, all the time, I think of, I think to myself, it's kind of like when I try a food now that I refuse to eat when I was younger, and I actually like the food. And I think to myself, son of a gun, I have missed out <laughs> all these years on this fantastic food because I didn't like how it looked, you know. And I, I, now I'm almost coming up the, the flip. It's like I, I want to be so open-minded because I don't want to miss the chance of having the opportunity to talk to Louis Simmons, you know, or miss the chance of learning something that could make me a better bodybuilder, a better powerlifter, a better coach, a better dad, you know. Um, yeah, I, I just – it's almost kind of fear-based that – keeps me more humble <laughs> and more mm -hmm. open mind <laughs> yeah because when i look back at like all all of my um pitfalls like injuries or whatever it's all stemmed from ego like when i tore my calf it was ego that basically made that happen Go so going into that training session i felt a little off did my squats I was like, ah, it feels kind of heavy today. It doesn't feel right. But I'm like, ah, just keep pushing through. You're all right. Don't be a sissy, whatever. Went to leg curls. Even those felt terrible. And I'm like, just keep going. Got to my calf raises. And normal weights I, I usually lift. I was like, ah, this just feels really heavy. So lowered the loads down considerably. The next set, like third or fourth rep in, the calf just gave way and tore. So instead of listening to my instincts and knowing like, okay, I'm not feeling normal today, just, hey, you need to keep pushing because I think a couple of things like ego and then fear, insecurity too. So it's like, I, I got to make progress and I want to lose progress. So basically, you know, instead of just, you know, listening to instinct, being a little humble and realize, okay, I just don't have it today. Let's just hang it up and come back the next day. 
I ended up losing, what, 9, 10, 11 weeks worth of normal training to allow that calf to heal. And it took me another four to six months to get my leg training back up to speed again. So, you know, I lost out on months of, of maybe, you know, optimal progress because the ego told me, hey, I need to persevere through one day of training. Um, so kind of like, you know, you're you're saying, Berto, like, you know, one rep won't make you, but it sure will break you. Well, I learned a hard, valuable lesson at that point. So that changed trajectory for me, you know, over the last six years. It's just like my overall training approach. Um, it definitely humbled me, in it, you know, in a, in a good way. So I learned from it. I mean, I was like, I remember when it happened. I remember being on the couch. And I remember texting you, Bert. I was like, shit. And you're like, no way. That happened? I'm like, yeah, it just happened. And I just remember you, you kind of just saying, hey, you know, kind of sucks, but, you know, turn it into a positive. So the positives is, yeah, I mean, the last six years of training has been um, as good as I could make it. It's a little more humbling now. I'm not as aggressive or the ego doesn't you know push me into bad positions you know 90 percent of the time now there's still that 10 percent where you know we're not we're human we're going to make mistakes here and there but that was a huge huge lesson that i learned in the weight room um and you learn sure learn from injuries like that you know and especially when you're screaming like a little girl on the way down <laughs> Yeah, I, I screamed scream. like a girl. I was That's like, not what I pictured. Jeff. No offense to girls, but my pitch, <laughs> my pitch was like, oh, it was like, yeah. it's like, so, you know, my wife came running out. She thought I killed my back because I was just on the ground. She's like, oh, my God, you hurt your back. I'm like, no, I, just, I, I thought I tore my Achilles. Um, but I'm like, no, I, I think I tore my Achilles. And then when I looked down, I, I realized it was my calf. Um, so it just felt like someone took a pair of scissors and just started cutting through my calf. That's what it felt like. Oh. Um, but that was a very humbling experience, no doubt. Uh, but the ego got me in hot water. Um, no, I remember weight room stuff like that. Like, uh, I had to have my best day. I felt like, especially when you were training at a gym with a bunch of people there and as a young man, it's like, you feel like you got to put on a show. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It might not be a... Might not be a four plate day on the squat. Be like, yeah, it's gonna be a four plate day because you know <laughs> I gotta give the people what they came to watch, and uh, and I've, I've I've been hurt because of similar reasons, you know. And and I think my worst one was because all my training partners were going about that heavy, um, and similar. I just didn't feel the same. I didn't feel right, and I, I I was not okay with saying I can't hang today. Let me go ahead and 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 back off a little bit. But in hindsight. Same, same as you, Jeff. That would have saved me uh, a, a whole lot of trouble. And um, yeah, so that's what that's how I learned that one. Um, but sometimes, shoot, it's like you have to learn the hard way about this ego thing. When in reality, it's like sometimes, man, I just I just wish these uh, the, the younger lifters, the the younger generation, just like just just learn from other people's mistakes. And I mean, we we do see people who, given how uh, uh, talented they are they, they're very low on ego so I, I, like josh you're josh uh, jeff you know mm -hmm. he's uh what is he he's 20 years old now right like yeah. jacked is like some people who've been lifting for not most people who've been lifting for 20 years but like talk about someone who when it comes to that that was the one thing about him that really got me was the fact that for as talented as he is like if you tell him if you take the time to dispense advice is what he he really really like takes the time to actually listen and apply it you know oh yeah yeah he's very very coachable very open so he, he, i remember in prep uh, it got to a point where he wasn't recovering as well so i lowered the volume down so he can you know maximize recovery and of course i think it was a little bit of a challenge you know mentally to uh, okay i gotta lower lower the workload down no, no one wants to work less because there's always that fear and security i'm not going to make the progress or whatever but he did, and, you know, he kind of saw the benefits of that, you know, recovered better. Um, there was also a time where he wanted to do more work, and I'm like, okay, let's go ahead. I'm going to allow you to do a little more work, and, you know, lesson learned. He realized really quick after a couple of weeks, like, okay, yeah, it's a little too much. Um, so it's, yeah, he's still young, still learning, um, but like you said, very open-minded, willing to learn. Um, but sometimes you have to let people like touch touch the hot water just a little bit, so it kind of just reinforces 
the reasonings why we want to, you know, be a little more humble with with approach, um, no doubt. Um, you know, I, I remember that one time when we were training, Berto, you were you were moving to Colorado. It was our last little meetup before you moved out. We were training. I forget what gym it was, but we were squatting, you and I. And a couple of racks over, there was these young kids. They're, well, call them kids. They're like late teens, maybe early 20s. They're, every single one of them were doing one rep max on squats. And they were just getting buried. Like one after, you remember that? One after the mm -hmm. other, they were just getting buried. It's and, like watching lemmings, yeah. And I just <laughs> remember just thinking to myself, they're going to get hurt. You know, it's like, what are you guys trying to prove? Like they're all just like, they're all in a pack. You know how people, when they get in packs, the ego swells even more. Because it's like you said, it's like, oh, I got to show these guys what I can do. Well, I mean, luckily none of them got injured, but man, there was probably what three or four of them that like basically tanked on squats, like just bam, crashed. So to me, it's like if you think about it, especially if as a bodybuilder, like yeah, it's cool to do a one rep max, but what does it really do for you as far as your physique? Like that one rep max isn't going to build the physique. It's actually the work that leads to it. That's what's building your physique. Um, not to say that we can't attempt these every so often, but we need to be safe about it. You know, do it in a controlled environment when it's when it's conducive to do so, but not in a pack of people just doing it on the fly. That was that was crazy to me. It just, it just yeah, and, and the vibe was I think they do that often. Yeah, yeah it seemed <laughs> like they they get together like once a week because I remember doing that in high school. Every Friday, let's see how much I could bench every Friday. Um, yeah. And it, now looking in hindsight, doesn't surprise me why I bench 330 only once. And every Friday I try to do three plates and it wouldn't move. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, that's about the, as much energy as I have right now. I gotta take a sip of this water because I'm prepping. <laughs> Jeff keeps his ego in check. He, he knows what, what the limits are. Um, but that's that's um, shoot. What when I think of. Uh, like my athletes and the ones that that that, that um, tend to do the best, like long term, uh, those are those are people like that. I think they're they're ones who they're they're very open to uh, the fact that they might not know everything yet, and and then also um, to constructive criticism. I think that one is is super super huge and. You know, we'll, we'll 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 see it often. Like you'll you'll see a bodybuilder who maybe surrounded themselves with a bunch of like yes men, you know, and you know the whole way. Out to, and especially I think with social media, if you have a decent following now, it does get to that point where, you know, you're mm -hmm. you're posting stuff up and it's all with the right lighting and and yeah. and you know basically, you know, anyone tells you otherwise, you know, outside of, if anyone tells you anything else other than like hey you're doing fantastic, you know they get some kind of retaliation. But they're, they're surrounded by all these yes men. So whether it be like someone with a decent following or, or just someone who maybe their friends at their gym are like constantly like, yeah, dude, you're about to take this place. Yeah, you you know, you 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 got this down. It's 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 on lock. And then what ends up happening is, shoot, you know, you you leave your little pond and you head over into this vast deep ocean and you find out the hard way that holy crap, like, that's that's not how, how it goes. And to tell you the truth, that's kind of sort of how it was for me during my first prep. It's like, you know, I was I was lifting the big weights in the gym, and within, like, my power builder friends who were on permabulks, I was relatively lead. <laughs> so, you know, to them, they were like, bruh, you're about to smash this, you know? You know, and obviously you come back, or, or some of them went to go see, and, like, they're telling you, hey, you got robbed when it's, like, the furthest thing mm -hmm. from the mm -hmm. case, you know? That's not going to help you. So I think that's huge. Just like surround yourself as, as an athlete with people who are going to constantly challenge you and push you to, to you know, like get out of your comfort zone from from time to time. Yeah, I didn't have that early on because I remember my first three seasons because I trained out of a small gym in Fremont, um, and there was no internet back then, so I only knew what was in the area. I didn't know, hey, what does a bodybuilder look like in three states over? I had no clue. It was just okay out these local shows. So in my little gym, I was like the man. And then I go to these local shows and, you know, I'm winning. So the ego is just swelling, swelling. And then I remember it was the 95 Mr. Fremont, which was for me at the time, Mr. Olympia. That was the show, right? 
um, if you win, you get the, your name, picture in the newspaper. You're like, oh, you're cool. So that was the goal. And so I had my heart set on winning that. And the ego was so big at that time. Like I truly believed because I, I felt like I worked harder than anybody else. I outworked everybody in my gym. Like the intensity level was off, off the chain. So I'm like, I'm the shit. Everybody's looking up to me in the gym because, oh, look at this guy's work ethic, blah, blah, blah. He's got a decent physique. And then I go to the show, I end up taking second. But in my mind, it was right away was like, I got robbed. Like, because that ego just made me believe that I deserve to win. So long story short, I go backstage. I make an ass of myself, like verbally, like pissed off, you know. I got robbed, I got screwed, blah, blah, blah. So in hindsight, not proud of it because I made myself look like an ass. Um, it's embarrassing now when I think about it. But at the time, I'm like, what's wrong with these judges? Like the whole panel of judges, they don't know what they're looking at. Um, and even like, shit, it took me like a long time to really realize like, yeah, I didn't win. <laughs> it's like looking at the pictures now, like, what, this is back in 95. I can look at those photos and go, oh, yeah, the guy that won had me like, 20 30 pounds of muscle so that ego is just it can blind you and you don't even realize it um so it's like it's hard to kind of say to somebody with like no one could tell me at the time your ego is getting in your way because it would have basically i would have just basically just denied it so I don't really know how to how to coach that. Like, how, how would you guys even coach that? Like, how would you break through to somebody with such an ego like that to humble them? Yeah, and that's that. I mean, it's not only hard to coach it; it it's just hard to put up with it. You know, I mean, exactly. Yeah. How many people have, have we experienced that it's just like, you know, I hate to say this, but you're just rubbing me the wrong way. You know, you need to get the hell away from me. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it is it is annoying, you know, and. You know, I, it's it's kind of like you said, Jeff. It's like, if it's my athlete, I have to say, okay, partner, you know what? We're not going to talk about this right now. Because even if I gave you my honest feedback, either A, you're not going to accept it, you know, or B, you're going to be pissed off at me, you know. Kind of like that 24-hour rule in football. You know, you take the loss, you mull over it and pout and cry for 24 hours, and then you put it behind you and you forget about it. And when, when, when the ego gets in the way, that's kind of my rule a lot of times. You know, it's like, okay, you know what you need to do is you need to sit for 24 hours and you need to mull and you need to pout and you need to bitch and you need to talk about how much you got robbed. And then once you calm down, then I'll give you my, my honest feedback. And that's kind of my rule, you know, almost low boy. Yeah. <laughs> You know, you know that you in that that I asked that question and you kind of answered it. it. It reminds me of not too long ago. Um, this is like two months ago. Athlete kind of upset, you know, about placing or whatever. And I was just brutally honest what I thought. And you know, I was like, "This is how I see it. This is what it is. This is how I feel like you're reacting." So I just called it out. And my thought process when I was telling them was. He might get mad. He might be upset. He might not talk to me, but it might sink in eventually. And so if this talk serves him really well, whether it's a day later, a month, year, I had just had to, I just had to do it. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you know what, if he's pissed off at me, so be it. Um, and I don't think it was well received initially, but I think like a day or two later, it, it, I think it was like, oh, okay. Um, but I still don't know if it's fully sunk in or not, um, but at least the seed is planted. So whether it gets watered and grows, I don't know. But it felt good to actually do that. So I probably like thinking about it now in hindsight. I wish I had someone tell me that mm -hmm. when I was when I was being an asswipe, you know, backstage. <laughs> What's interesting is the year before at that same show, I was in the overall there. I didn't win the overall. I lost. But the guy that won, he was just a freak. So I already like my ego wasn't wasn't that that bad to where I, I felt like I should have won that one. But that guy that won, he had a huge ego and he was so mad that the stage was small because he couldn't do his full posing routine. He couldn't move around like he wanted to. 
So he literally was like throwing a tantrum backstage and like throwing he was throwing his bag and stuff. That's how how upset he was over that. So I'm like, it's kind of just I've seen a lot of ugliness in in the sport of bodybuilding, whether it's like bad like whether you feel like you should get a better placing or or what have you just like or even on like Berto was saying on on you know the social media where it's just like you can just see like that ego is just coming through and it's it's kind of an ugly it makes bodybuilding like a have an ugly side to it and i was part of that like back in the day um and, and i always say like if there was internet back in the 90s man i don't think too many people would have liked me too much <laughs> Jeff, I'm taking pictures in front of a sports car. A, hey, hey, uh, <laughs> what would it be? It'd be a What's Pontiac it? Fiero. That's what. It yeah, is. like I used yeah. to wear like the super short shorts to show the quads. <laughs> I wore the tight tank tops, the gold chain. You know, I had my my mullet and all that. So. <laughs> and I would walk around like that at the gym. You know, I would even use like Nivea. Uh, lotion so because it oh. shined so i could look shiny yeah. all the time um it was just like it was ridiculous when i think about it like the whole my whole like world revolved around like the vanity of, mm -hmm. of bodybuilding and it didn't dawn on me at the time like i can use what i was doing as a vehicle to educate and to help people versus hey look at me like i want all this attention i need the attention so that's like stemming from ego, it's stemming from insecurity and all that type of thing. So so now it's like, I try to like flip it now, the opposite. I mean, there's times, yeah, everybody wants attention and likes it, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's great, but I try to make sure that the platform that I'm on and I know that we're all on, we try to educate um, and use bodybuilding as a vehicle to not just help people with their, their physique and get stronger or whatever, but become better humans. Before we get on the the positives of uh, of ego, Jeff, did you ever get any uh, nice photo shoots in front of that that Chevy Stepside pickup or that that, that uh, Pontiac Firebird that you had with your short shorts and your sunglasses and your mullet? No, just me driving it with a mullet. I didn't actually take any pictures <laughs> with it. I got some doozies though on the beach though that I'm not too proud of, and it's just like I can't stand to look at anymore. <laughs> you got to post those at some point, man. Thanks so much for listening, guys. 3DMJ prides itself on keeping this show, our blog, and our YouTube channel as free and relevant sources of information for our community week after week. We also release additional free video courses as often as possible at 3DMJVault.com. If you'd like to help support our mission and our work, please consider becoming a monthly patron of our endeavors. Go to patreon.com slash team 3DMJ and donate a couple dollars per month to our cause of helping educate and grow the drug-free bodybuilding and powerlifting communities worldwide. You can definitely choose to donate more, and if you do so, we'll send you a discount code for future use on any of our paid products, but any little bit helps and we appreciate your monthly support in any amount that you see fit. So again, you can start assisting the team at patreon.com slash team 3DMJ, that's P A T. R E O N dot com slash team three DMJ. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy the rest of the show. So the thing about ego, it seems like it makes you have issues with being accountable for your own actions sometimes. That's that's uh, that's what I've gathered. And it's funny because initially I was talking about how I felt like I didn't need anyone, right? Um, Oh, we felt like we didn't need anyone. Like we, we, we knew enough. But at the same time, it's like, ah, like it, when I think about it, it, did stem from insecurity because I wasn't ready to necessarily hear about my shortcomings because the sport made me feel awesome about myself in many ways. And you know, to have that taken away, I just I wasn't ready, and I didn't see the long term game in that. Like, hey, 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 you know, like this, this is cool. This makes you feel really good about yourself. It's it's cool to set out to you know create these goals, to accomplish them, and see yourself progress. But if you really, really, really want to feel good about yourself, how about you put that ego off to the side, and uh, and yeah, have a have a you know the right set of individuals that sometimes like you know help you move on and, and get even better, and. Um, so yeah, with I think with the physique athlete or just any sort of like iron game player, that's that's kind of the issue. Is like if uh, if you're not open to feedback, that can 
<laughs> that can definitely impact how how far you, you go in, in, in the long term. And I mean, shoot, we've seen it with some of the best guys on the planet. Like, it's crazy how freaky genetics can get at like um, at the top of any sport. Like, I don't know, you remember you remember our Jordan Cup Jeff, like back in 2011, who we shared. We're not going to say names, but who we shared the the dressing room with, right? And, like, this dude was doing so many things wrong. But the issue is he looked like a freak. Like, it didn't matter. But it makes you think. It's like, wow, could you imagine if this person and, and this awesome vessel they were blessed with, if they were to take the time to just be a flat-out student of the game, to be like a slave? And I think um, – I think we see that in other sports. In other sports with like much bigger gene pools, it's like, hey, there's enough freaks running around where you have a guy like, um, say, like Kobe Bryant, who's like borderline like crazy. And like he's like, okay, I'm gonna get a shooting coach, I'm gonna get a conditioning coach, I'm gonna get this, I'm gonna get that, and you know they surround themselves with like perfect team almost, and and because of that, we get to see these like freaky, freaky things come out. And I think with bodybuilding, that's probably my most frustrating thing is that it's it's far and few that you see like a freak of nature. And you wonder to yourself, it's like, man, could you imagine if, for example, homie that was sharing the room with us, if he were to take a three to four year off season and he were to have someone, you know, create a much better training program, because you have an idea what that training is probably like, right? Mm -hmm. And right. Uh, and they got a 20 something week diet because this one would usually diet like in 12 weeks, like usually it's like crunch yeah. diet, you know? And, uh, and you know, something's wrong when you're like, Sometimes you're 176 shredded, sometimes you're 186 shredded, and it's just because you're messing around with things that much that your body is like that pliable that you're able yeah. to get away with stuff. So anyhow, yeah, without getting too far away from from the um, from the topic, I think everyone kind of deals with that to a certain extent. Is that you know we're all in the long run. I, I think when it comes to the progress and the gains you, you didn't make, most of the time it's like our own damn fault. Like when we look at the net losses across a career, it's yeah, like us kind of, getting in our own way. Yeah, exactly. Getting in our own way. I was just going to say that. Um, but yeah, that's just goes to show like even the best of the best, like there's still room for more potential and more growth. So uh, I think a perfect example of someone being opposite ego would be Brian Whitaker, like super humble. Like the dude like wins championships left and right. But yet, after every championship, we always hear about him emailing specific people who he finds very credible to give him feedback on what he needs to do to get better. Like, here's the one of the best natural bodybuilders of all time still wanting to get better and better. And he gets better and better is because he is open-minded and, and wanting to learn you know, more and more to, to up his game. So that's something that I find uh, very inspiring about him. Like he's got a great physique, but I think it's more of like the, the mental makeup um, and just who he is as a person that's that's more inspiring than the actual physique. And I think just the physique is the, the byproduct of that. Yeah, yeah. And um, I remember going to, I was, uh, me and him were part of one of, uh, of Lane Norton's camps like a few years back and there was a lot of good presenters that were speaking about things that I think, yeah, they were pretty relevant to, to Brian and what he was trying to do. And I could just see him there sitting down as like, uh, you know, this person was talking, that person was talking, like his brain was just like lighting up. And it, it was crazy to see that the following year he made all these changes uh, to his training uh, because he, 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 you know, he took that as a chance to like network and, and get these people in his corner, and that was a year that I think his quads like just like just oh, yeah, yeah. jumped up drastically. Um, so so yeah, no, Brian is Brian is like that man. He does a terrific job of just being super objective and, and getting out of his own way, and that's 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 just such an admirable thing to see. Yeah, that, that some guy at a, at a at a for a guy who's competing at like the not not just at the best level, but he's I think he's the only dude who's ever won both the Yorton Cup and Worlds like the same year. Like no one's done that. Doug Miller hasn't done that. Philip Ricardo Jr. hasn't done that. Like Brian's the only guy, and you'll still get that email after that win. 
<laughs> what do I need to do? Yeah, what I need to work on. Yeah. And it's not a, it's probably not an email that comes like a month later. It's like the next day or two days later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And he accomplished that for after that time off that he had where he was doing all of his homework, it seemed like. You know, he was really quiet. But yet at the same time, he was just probably absorbing all of that information. And then, um, yeah, like you said, look what he accomplished, something that nobody's ever accomplished before. Yeah, I think my, like for me, my, my best progress has came, you know, in my 40s versus, you know, my teens, 20s, 30s. I mean, yeah, I had some, some nice strides in my younger days um, just through pure work, work ethic. Um, but it wasn't until like I met you guys where you, you guys are like, hey, why don't you tone down that intensity and maybe do a little more volume or, you know, change the way I kind of approach nutrition. And so I basically let some walls down, which you, I know you guys know it took a little bit of, of, of coaxing to get me to do that. But eventually once I did, you know, going from 160 pounds on stage in 2009 as a 38 year old and then. Coming two years later in 2011 at 170 pounds as a 40 year old, um, yeah, it was a, it was a huge huge transformation there. And it wasn't so much, hey, Jeff put on 10 pounds of muscle. It was just like I was getting in my own way and eating up a lot of muscle all those years. Mm -hmm. So again, it's like that was probably like the biggest thing I've ever done over my career was not so much the the, the physicality. It was more like the mental. Like, again, just, you know, having a different uh, mindset around, you know, being humble, letting walls, you know, letting the walls come down, um, willing to listen a little more. And I'm not perfect. I still have my moments. Um, and I think Eric can vouch for this, that, you know, he's still to this day like, hey, Jeff, we, we probably should do this. And I'm like, hey, Eric, I got this. Um, <laughs> so there's sometimes I get a little stubborn. But eventually I come around. I'm like, OK, like today we kind of exchanged some messages and, you know, he wanted me to take a diet break after my last show for a week. I'm like, ah, I did one for about four days. I'm good. I feel OK. Uh, as you guys saw, I had a little little episode on Saturday where I ate with my family some pizza, ate a little too much. And I'm like, yep, you're right. I probably should have took a week diet break. <laughs> so it, it still, I'm not perfect, but it's still like if we would have went, let's say if this was like 10 or 15 years ago, I would have had, had none of it. I would have said, Eric, you don't know what you're talking about. And I would have just kept doing my thing. So again, it's just that that willingness to to let your guard down, to be vulnerable. Um, it's okay to be insecure at times because when you get out of your comfort zone, you learn more about yourself and more about everything else. Yes. When you are out of your comfort comfort zone, versus hey, you know, like my case, being the big fish in the small pond, you're only going to learn so much. You're just you just all, all you're going to have is like a swelled head, big ego. And eventually, you got to come out of that pond at some point. Then what? By the shark. <laughs> yeah, the shark's going to eat you up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Speaking of which, I think that that was one thing about Eric that I got to give him props about. Like, he let me handle, like, all the planning when it came to his prep, and he was the easiest athlete to coach. Like, so it was just like, right, do this, this, and that. And... Um, you know, obviously he had input on stuff, but especially when it got to the point where, you know, you get the prep brain, he literally was like, Bert, just tell me what I need to do and I'm going to do it. And this is a guy that, you know, like, obviously he's, he's, he's renowned around the world for, you know, teaching people how to, how to do the bodybuilding. Right. So, um, so yeah, that was, that was super impressive. Super impressive. I was curious. I'm like, all right. So it's been since 2000, what was it? 14, 14, right? 2011. 11. Okay, that's right. He's been doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, wow, a lot has changed. Let's see if uh, if, uh, if, uh, if you can still be the athlete and I can still be the coach. And no, absolutely. He, he he got out of my way when he needed to and, and he got the work done. Yeah, and when it comes to, to coaching, I remember some of the best advice that you gave me, Albert, um, when I was a little bit insecure about my coaching and I was not very confident, you know, in my coaching. And uh, I think we were all sitting around the, the kitchen table for one of our meetings at Eric's house there uh, in South Sacramento. And you, you, you basically came right out and you kind of looked at me and you put your finger up, you know, kind of the way that you do and you go, 
you know, Brad, the thing that you need to do is you need to just pretend like you're walking in the room and your cock is this big. Oh, wow. You need <laughs> to, to take that, that shit that you know and you need to just own up to it and man it. And I remember thinking to myself at the time, I was like, whoa, <laughs> that's, a, that's a confidence level that I don't think that I've ever... <laughs> <laughs> that I've ever had before. For the listeners, like he held his 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 hands like about three feet apart. He's I'm like, pretty, you need to I'm, walk into the room like your cock is this big. I'm pretty confident. <laughs> I'm pretty confident. Brad went to church after that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but at the same time, it was kind of one of those things where I needed to hear that. You know, I needed to hear. You know what you you do you do know what you're doing at least you know for what we knew at the time, mm. yeah. and you need to instill that confidence because that confidence is going to be instilled into your athlete, and your athlete um, is going to be <laughs> your athlete is going to be more confident in, in what they're doing and what they're going to have more buy-in, you know, in the mm-hmm. process. Um, you know, if you instill that if you instill that kind of confidence in yourself. And while it, it's, it's definitely something that um, probably want to temper, you know, and balance, mm-hmm. honestly, I think that was probably one of the best piece of advi- it, pieces of advice that I ever got, you know, when it comes to being a coach. And I use it still to this day, and not just in bodybuilding, you know, I kind of use it in when I work at the hospital, you know, as a, as a, a, a CAT scan tech, and when I'm coaching. He walks athlete, into the room. Yeah. Like <laughs> I guess I guess that's the the opposite side of the sword, right? Like you do have to have healthy ego mm-hmm. to to move you forward as well. So not just like, oh, okay, I need to be humble 100 percent of the time. Like you could be have an ego, but it has to be, I guess, in a way where it's mature, you know, and you're humble about it at the same time. Um, so that's. Yeah, you have to have confidence and just like, you know, you be, you have to be able to assert yourself, you know, in, in a good way. And that's probably what you, you basically like what Berto is basically talking about. Because, yeah, I remember him saying that. I don't remember. I don't even want to repeat it. I don't remember him saying that part. <laughs> <laughs> but I do remember him saying, you know, Brad, you need to be confident. You know your stuff. You just need to be confident about it and express it. And. I mean, I get that way, too, sometimes as well. I'm like, well, you know, I don't like sometimes on social media, I get quiet. It's not because I don't feel like I don't know anything, but sometimes I get a little. Um, I wouldn't say insecure, but like I don't want to engage sometimes like I'm not confident, like I don't like to debate. So I don't like to like sometimes like put stuff out there and then have people counter it. Like I don't like to get into debates, but I know my stuff, but sometimes I get timid because I'm not confrontational. And so sometimes I have to just tell myself, no, you know your stuff. You've been doing this for over 30 years. You may not know every intricate detail of the science, but you have so much practical experience. Like you need to basically throw that out there because it's not too often you see someone with 30 plus years of experience sharing that online with people. So a lot of times I have to tell, like, remind myself of that. And no, I need to, I need to post stuff. I need to see if I can help other people out. So it's like, um, like sometimes that, uh, like the ego, I need to have like some ego, some confidence to do that. So I I guess I, I guess that's what I'm kind of saying, I guess. Hopefully I'm verbalizing that to where it makes sense. No, it does. It does. does. Um, does. And, and, And for me, it shows up, especially with my my extremely gifted athletes because you know we've all had relative freaks that have come across you know our our desk and i know for me it's kind of like well gosh how, how can i be coaching this person you know such and such genetic freak and powerlifting bodybuilding whatever and a lot of times those are the ones that for me are, are, are the toughest to coach because I'll re-record vlogs sometimes because it's like, well, you know, we could do this and we could do that. And really, it's kind of not a right and wrong answer. And then I'll be like, wait a minute, Brad, 
stop, you know, and I hit the stop button, delete it. And it's like, you know what? That's not what they're looking for. You know, yes, they're gifted. Yes, they're a freak, but they need, they need to hear your confidence in order to have confidence in what they're doing. And that's where it kind of shows up with me, you know, more the, more so than on social media, because I mean, let's face it, nobody listens to me on social media much anyway, <laughs> but it shows up for me on, on, on coaching. I need to, I need to, to, I need to, you know, express that confidence that yes, you know what, I've studied this stuff over and over and over again. I'm a super big fan of the game. Um, I do have 20 some years of experience. You know, I have competed in a dozen shows and I need to rely on all that and express that confidence so that that person has confidence in their plan and then they can excel, you know, in their sports, whatever it is. Yeah, I kind of feel the same way because I've, I've coached like people with PhDs, um, educators, superintendents, principals, like all these people with like high education. And it's intimidating because I'm like, oh, yeah, OK, I got a high school diploma. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I remind myself, well, wait a second here. Like I got 30 plus years of bodybuilding experience in the trenches. Plus, I'm almost 50 years old. I have a lot of life experience. So. I can definitely use that to my advantage. Like people, they may be highly educated, have a PhD, but that doesn't necessarily mean they know a lot about bodybuilding or how to stru- you know, structure training and all that. So I think, um, you know, I'm kind of over that initial fear of that. Like now it's like, I'm a lot more confident. So I'm like, okay, yeah, they might be smarter than me, get on a Skype call or something. They're highly intelligent, smarter than me. But most of the time, people are just, they're looking for structure, they're looking, looking for guidance, and they're looking for someone to, you know, be understanding, have empathy, um, you know, be able to, you know, crack the whip when you need to. So, in a sense, they need a coach. They need, they need guidance. Um, so, yeah, I mean, sometimes, like, yeah, you have to get assertive, like, have that confidence, have a little bit of ego, and just, and just roll with it. Um, and there's... There's other times where, yeah, like sometimes I'm like pulling myself back a little bit. No, okay, I can't be, you know, so high up. I got to level it out. So it's like you have to be kind of even keeled. And I try to do my best with it, but not always perfect. But I think now I'm like more aware of when I when I am like, you know, doing okay with the ego and when I'm not. Like I'm pretty good at it. Like I said, there might be a slight delay with it at times, but I think that awareness is really key. Um, to keep yourself pretty much in check. Mm-hmm. I feel that my ego over the years, it's like maybe when I was younger, it was, I mean, we hear the word inflated, but that's exactly what it is. Like I had all these fake badges that I didn't really earn, you know? And it's like you, after that, at a certain point, you're like, right, let's take all this, all this shit off. I didn't earn this. Let's really get down to like what I am and what I know. And you build it back up the right way. And I think um, that's probably the, the biggest difference because, yeah, I think there's a time and a place to, all right, like, let's, let's wake up, let's be confident. I know what I can do, but I also know what I can't and what I still need to work on. And um, so, but like, like Brad said, it's like me personally, like if there is too much doubt behind like um, my movement, like that can like, come back and hit me in the butt and I end up doing a shittier job because I I don't feel that way when I walk into the room you know um so like to me if like a, a big example of this is like contest day it's like you know I I like to wake up feeling confident but like no matter who's there it's like I'm the one who's trouble you know and I'm I'm here to, to basically win but at the same time if I don't play as, as well as I hoped I did I, as well as I would have wished I did I I I don't blame the judges, you know, and I, I'm not going to insult other guys' work ethic because, you know, I don't know what they've been through to get to that point. Like, that's disrespectful. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I think, yeah, being confident and, and uh, being self-aware, like, if you match those two things up, like, well, and you balance those things, well, like, it, it, can, it, can, it can do a lot for you. Like, I guess at the one time where ego can... I guess help you uh, actually uh, progress and, and and help others. Word. The uh, confidence guru himself. <laughs> the, con- the confidence coach himself. That's what I should say. 
Yeah. No, but but I think especially if you are a competitive competitive athlete, you, you do need to you need to have a certain baseline of confidence. You need to, you know. Um, you need to be real too. Like we've we've known those people. It's like, oh, oh, oh you're delusional. Like, like let's let's let's. This is your first season. Can we like not talk about pro card just yet? And like let's just like mm -hmm. make it to you know just making it to your first shows is a big deal. So, um, so as much as I like confidence, it's like hey, it's something that you you know you want to pace and. And uh, when it comes to ego growth, I guess it needs to be sustainable and slow. You know, that's the best way to do it. But. What was I going to say so, about, yeah, heading into, I'm heading into Worlds, six and a half yeah. weeks. I would say ego, I, it's definitely like I, I'm not going into it thinking I'm going to win. I would love to. Um, I am definitely would, will try to when I'm up there. But I think for me, like, it's just... I kind of know like the talent level that's going to be there. Um, so it's like I, I'm trying to keep a, a realistic expectation going in there. Like, okay, just make myself the best I can. And, you know, whatever happens, happens. And you better believe when I'm on stage, though, you know, if I have to give an elbow or two um, <laughs> in a nice way, I'll do it. Ask Sam about that one, right? Um, <laughs> I'll do it. Um, but at the same time, like you said, it's like, I know I work hard and I'm proud of that. Uh, but I don't think I necessarily work harder than the next guys next to me because they can be they can be outworking me. They, you know, maybe if I place ahead of somebody, maybe they worked harder than me. I mean, just just genetically, I'm just, you know, better. Like I came out of the womb better. And that's why I won. Not necessarily because of my work ethic or anything mm -hmm. like that. Um, but yeah, I definitely try to respect, you know, everybody that's on stage because they all, they all have a journey. They all have their, their ups and downs and they deserve to be on that stage. And whether, you know, I win or lose, you know, you have to respect, you know, everybody's, everybody's journey. And I think, um, I think that's, what's really nice about natural bodybuilding as a whole. Like there's a lot of the camaraderie and I think that's because everybody, for the most part, appreciates, mm -hmm. you know, what it takes to get there. Um, and I, like I said, I could go back to, you know, my early days of competing and think I was a shit and think I deserved to win. It was just such a ugly and embarrassing moment. Um, but again, I was young, immature. Um, but I think now because of, you know, what we what we teach, what we express, what social media, there's a lot of great coaches out there that, you know, are teaching more than just, hey, this is the X and O's to get shredded. Um, I think we're seeing, as a whole, um, a little more uh, humbling of the sport, in my opinion, from what I've seen anyways over the years. I don't know where that was going, but I was rambling. But, yeah, no, that's, 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 that's your current prep. ego status. That's prep know. brain. Yeah. I think my, my next goal in regards to ego is at some point I want to hand over my training to someone. That's going to be my next thing. But... I think uh, I just want to be healthy enough to the point where I'm like super predictable because that's the one thing where, you know, you have when you have a few things that, you know, can flare up, um, it's hard to program for that. I know because I've like with my athletes that are broken, it's like, damn it, like, can, can we just like stay together for like two months? Um, <laughs> so I think once I feel like, okay, I'm really out of the woods and like everything feels wonderful, like I'd love to, uh, it, it's been since 2014 that I've let someone handled my training and uh that was um that was with uh with ben escrow on the way to usapl nationals and i i enjoyed it it, it actually um yeah it helped build me up because i'm like man i can follow directions really well and if uh coach writes something up for me it's like i take it as a challenge like i am this is the best work you're ever gonna see done watch and like i i, I try to you know i try to impress my coach so um yeah it brought up the best in me in some ways and it let me not get in my own way. So I think once things are like perfect, perfect or close to that, I'm gonna go ahead and let someone else just take over the training and I'll do it and just do it and just work without ego. Brad, where's your week ago today compared to the Max OT days? <laughs> um, well, I, I, you know, I can honestly say that one of my most enjoyable aspects of our uh, interaction is is research and development. You know, I I love hearing you know Eric talk about 
stuff that he's researching and that he's doing and how most importantly we, we can apply it. Um, probably a, a shameless plug, but I love hearing the mass audio roundtables, you know, and listening to, to, to Greg and, and uh, Mike Z, you know, talk about stuff and then how we can apply it, you know. Um, never again am I going to be regretting stuff that I was close-minded to in the past, you know. Um, I don't ever want to be there again. I don't ever want to I found out that I love Brussels sprouts, you guys. And for years and years and years, I never ate Brussels sprouts. And I'm really pissed off that I never ate Brussels sprouts when I was younger. You know? It's terrific, man. And, and so, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to look back like that anymore. I don't want to look back and be pissed off that I I didn't. I wasn't open minded enough to to eat Brussels sprouts or to actually have my reps be higher than six, you know, and and actually have more volume you know, and, and go through periods of, of intensity and volume, et cetera. I never want to look back and be pissed off at myself that I, I, I wasn't open-minded enough. Hey, well, we've come a long way, boys. Absolutely. <laughs> I think I better go chop up some Brussels sprouts and put them in the wok and maybe put some, <laughs> a little bit of olive oil, some garlic salt on there. And I'm going to humbly eat those bad boys. <laughs> They're really good, too, if you just, like, stick them in the oven and just kind of roast them a little bit with some garlic and some some seasoning. Oh, man, they're really good, buddy. <laughs> and those things are, like, almost negative calories. So enjoy your, enjoy your prep meal. That's going to be my post-show meal. So would you have pizza, burgers, fries? Nah, I had Brad's Brussels sprouts. <laughs> Because, oh, you throw some it, bacon bits. In my thing things? is this big, and I'm confident in those brussels. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So, well, yeah, we'll we'll um, we'll post the recipe for Brad's uh, BD Brussels sprouts at some point. Uh, wrong, but I, I guess that's 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 our podcast on ego, right? We'll, we'll humbly. Leave it here, and we we'll appreciate everyone who, who tuned in and put up with what I think was a little bit of everything, but hopefully we, we got our point across today. Hey, everybody. It's Eric Helms. Thanks for tuning into our podcast. As you know, at 3DMJ, we promote evidence-based approaches to the lifting community. If that's something you want to dive deeper into, I'd encourage you to check out my research review, Monthly Applications in Strength Sport, or for short, MASS. This is a review that myself... Dr. Mike Zerdos and Greg Knuckles put out every month. We cover the latest research publications that are applicable to strength and physique athletes, or anyone who's looking to get stronger or improve their body comp. Our content is in both written and video format. For more information on how to subscribe, check out 3dmusclejourney.com slash mass. That's 3dmusclejourney.com slash M-A-S-S for further details. Thanks for tuning in.